are facing an unprecedented health crisis. British consultant cardiologist and public health campaigner Dr. Asim Malhotra will be highlighting the major root causes behind it. Malhotra is an author and influential doctor in the UK. An in-depth talk about the two industries that are drivers of misinformation and ill health, big food and big pharma. Welcome in Belgium, Dr. Asim Malhotra. Thank you for having me, Ellen. <laughs> Lovely to be here. How are you feeling? Because you've been traveling a lot <laughs> lately. Um, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah, it's been uh, quite hectic. Um, probably last, I'd say six months has been pretty hectic. Yeah, a lot of international travel. Um, just came back from Dallas, Texas, having done, uh, giving a lecture there as part of um, Frontline uh, Critical, uh, COVID Critical Care Alliance. I was invited to speak at their conference. These are people who are looking at um, treatments for COVID and also people who have suffered vaccine injuries. And uh, during that time I was there, I also flew out to do Joe Rogan. So yeah, it's been, uh, and I literally just came back from Texas yesterday. Mm -hmm. so well, I'm very honored that I can interview you here in Antwerp <laughs> after Joe Rogan. So um, yeah, people know you as a cardiologist and as a bestseller author, and you've been uh, campaigning. Uh, for a long time, but if people ask you nowadays, uh, what do you do in life? What do you tell them? Well, first and foremost, I'm a, a practicing consultant cardiologist, so that, mm -hmm. that has never changed or stopped. The amount of time I spend with clinical work has obviously reduced a little bit mm -hmm. because um, I'm also teaching, I'm lecturing, I'm act, being an activist. Um, so I do a mixture of things, yeah, but I would probably call myself, um, you know, a consultant cardiologist and a public health campaigner and probably, you know, a spiritual activist now. Ooh. Because people nowadays, I mean, you got well known all over the globe because of your um, campaign, your activism, strong activism eh, against the rollout of the mRNA vaccines. But actually, you've been fighting against medical disinformation for a long time already. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, my activism, I think, work goes back probably well over 10 years um, and on an international scale as well. So I started really, in, I, I came into the spotlight in the mainstream in the UK, probably 2011, early 2011. Um, and that was following me writing an article which was published as a front page com commentary in the Observer newspaper, which is part of the Guardian group, uh, which has a lot of impact. I hadn't realized how much impact until I published it. Well, I'd written about the fact that um, I'd met Jamie Oliver. I'd written to him originally um, asking him to uh, see if he could do something about hospital food. One of the things that really uh, I felt very uh, troubled by was the fact that we have this big obesity epidemic, yet our hospitals were full of junk food. We were serving junk food to heart attack patients after they've had a heart attack. So I wrote about that in The Observer. And, um, and that's really where I think things took off a little bit more for me in terms of being asked and to do more uh, mainstream media, you know, on these topics of obesity. So that's really where things started. And then as things evolved, um, I got involved in a lot of different things, but the one that get, got me, I think, the most prominence was my campaign against sugar and excess sugar consumption and realizing there was a big problem there. Um, and I was the first science director of a organization called Action on Sugar. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we launched our campaign, which basically hit the front page of newspapers and had a big impact in, in 2014. But the year prior to that, I had been writing about, um, uh, I'd been writing for the British Medical Journal. So a lot of my work actually has been through medical journals, through so research and publications in medical journals. And almost everything I've written, Ellen, in a medical journal in the last 10 years, almost everything has hit the mainstream news. And that's partly because of what the topic, but partly because of me in the sense that I write because I think there's something important to say that people need to hear. Everybody needs to hear mm -hmm. because obviously I'm an advocate for people's health. And, every, and when you ask people what's most important to them in their life, it's health that comes number one. So I would think most people certainly would be interested in the kind of things I, 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 I talk about and write about. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, and, and because of, with that understanding, because I want to change the system to improve people's health, you know, one of the most way, important ways to do that is through the mainstream media. So I, I would make sure 
or the medical journals themselves would press release a lot of my articles and then it would go to journalists and be embargoed and next thing I know I'm on the front page of newspapers. So that started, you know, 2013. Mm -hmm. And did you manage um, to get things done in, in the UK with Jamie Oliver? And the yeah, the, the Jamie Oliver thing was interesting because when the campaign started, it was dissemination of information and knowledge through articles I'd written. It was getting other people on board, supporting it, them also you know, moving, moving that case forward. Um, and uh, ultimately that resulted in me uh, going to Parliament, meeting the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, because we advocated for uh, attacks on sugary drinks. In fact, actually, now uh, I've, I've fast forwarded a bit too much. It was actually in, 2000 and, um, in 2012, I was invited to be on a group of, uh, called the Medical Royal College's Obesity Steering Group. So this is the body or the organization that represents every doctor in the UK. Mm -hmm. And, the chair, and the, chair, the chair of that organization, Professor Terence Stevenson at that time, arguably the most important doctor in the UK, he had met me in Jamie Oliver's um, uh, office where we had basically had a meeting and discussion on obesity. Jamie Oliver had invited a few doctors to ta discuss this. So I think he was impressed with the way I was communicating and, and talking about it. And then I mentioned him again, wrote this piece in The Observer, mentioning he was there. And then he invited me to be part of this group, which is a good learning experience for me because I was a junior doctor and I was put amongst this panel of, of very eminent professors in obesity, nutrition, public health, and uh, would sit, and we, we, would, we spent a year reviewing the evidence on what to, needs to be done on a policy level to tackle, tackle obesity. And one of the things that I pushed very strongly in there, were there were two things. One was um, get rid of junk food in hospitals, and the other one was a, um, a tax on sugary drinks. So that- And what about the schools? Yeah. Better meals in schools? Uh, yeah, all of that yeah. was there, oh, yeah. absolutely. There was a big list of things, better meals in schools, better, you know, um, uh, compulsory, we, and, uh, we talked about getting compulsory um, food and nutrition um, and cooking skills introduced, you know, um, into schools. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'd actually separately coordinated a letter and I'd managed to get the signatures of Jamie Oliver on there and then the England football captain, Stephen Gerrard because I knew the uh, Liverpool first team doctor and he got, and that became the main like headline news in BBC. And that happened actually in 2012, that, cause that happened before. So there's lots of things that I've been involved in. You know, I, I, did a, I did a report for BBC Newsnight, which is a very important, impactful public um, current affairs program. Mm -hmm. In the summer of 2012, you may remember we had the Olympic games in London and I had written about the fact, you know, why, uh, why during an obesity epidemic are the main sponsors of the Olympics McDonald's, Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. Cadbury's and Heineken. Mm -hmm. So they, they featured me, I did a report for them and um, as the angry cardiologist and it was their headline. That's the kind of thing, every, you know, it's like a nighttime program, politicians watch it, prime minister watches, that kind of thing. And that again catapulted me a little bit more as a sort of someone who's um, a campaigner on this issue. Mm -hmm. Because actually what you're stating is sugar is the biggest harm, whereas we've been told, uh, especially I remember in the 90s, avoid fats, uh, light products came up, uh, no fat. But you're stating, well, these fats are actually um, very essential for our health. Yeah, no, absolutely. So first and foremost, in terms of the three macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate and protein, you, carbohydrate is not essential for survival. You cannot survive without fat and protein, but you can survive without carbohydrates, mm -hmm. right? So that's the first thing to say. But obviously there are good quality carbohydrates and not so good quality carbohydrates. And sugar was the worst culprit in many ways because it has no nutritional value. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we know that uh, the consumption of excess sugar either, you know, either it makes you gain weight um, as almost like a food additive, as a food stimulant, if you uh, appetite stimulant. Or even if you're a normal weight, you know, it's going to make you nutritionally deficient if you're having a lot of sugar in your diet because, you know, it's, you're, you know you're replacing sugar with other, uh, uh, sugar is, is replacing other more nutritious foods. So I'd done a lot of extensive sort of research looking at the harms of excess sugar and realized that we were, most of the population were consuming two or three times more than the limit that was probably okay for health or certainly wouldn't give you significant risk of disease. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely right, yeah. So this whole, you know, people should not fear fat, 
right? Because one, you need it, and it has, you know, it has so many important properties in the body. Um, even for brain health, um, it's important. But also, it's satiating. Fat keeps you full. Um, you need to absorb vitamins. So it's, 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 a, it's an essential nutrient. Mm -hmm. And what the research is also showing is that a lot, as long as you keep refined carbohydrates low, um, eating fat, uh, you know, is um, a, as likely to make you fat as eating green vegetables is to turn you green. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it doesn't happen once you go. So that's why the, the low carbohydrate diet so it became very popular because um, people who followed them actually found that they would lose weight. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is sugar and other refined carbohydrates raise insulin more than protein and more than fat. And insulin is a fat storing hormone. So there was lots of misconceptions people had. People that thought eating fat makes you fat. And yeah, of course but that's that, also because we were misled uh, by the food industry. Yeah? yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think for, misled by the food industry. Actually, to be honest, it started more with a flawed science mm -hmm. where some very important key scientists in the nutrition world, um, you know, during the 50s and 60s, through their research, believed that eating fat and specifically saturated fat, which you find in butter and cheese and meat, red meat and all that kind of thing, um, was the main culprit in the cause of heart disease. Heart disease was increasing in the Western world from about 1920 to 1970, certainly a lot of people dying. That's before that we had realized or accepted or fully appreciated the impact of smoking, which we now know was really, really bad. And the nutrition scientists were arguing about fat and sugar, but the one who said it was fat was a culprit, he won the argument. Um, he had a lot of power, he had sugar industry behind him. And as a result of that flawed science, which was lower the fat to reduce heart disease, which was the main major issue, the food industry exploited that and the sugar industry exploited that. And then you have all of the refined carbohydrate foods. Their guide, nutrition guidelines changed, you know, um, in, 19, late, in 1977 in the US and 1981 in the UK. Um, the guidelines changed basically to tell people to cur curb their fat consumption to less than 30% of calories and saturated fat to less than 10% of calories. But the replacement was automatically, because protein tends to stay the same, about 15 to 20% of calories, is that that, that re resulted in people eating more carbohydrates. But it wasn't good quality carbohydrates. It wasn't whole fruit and vegetables. It was starch. Mm -hmm. It was bread. It was pasta. It was rice. It was potatoes. And that has... There's a very good case to be made that that is what has fueled the obesity epidemic because up until about 1980, there wasn't really much of an obesity problem. We see it completely skyrocket after that. And ironically, has increased risk of heart disease when the primary purpose was to lower risk of heart disease. Mm -hmm. And we also know, Ellen, as well, that lowering fat as well, lowering cholesterol, doesn't do anything to protect people from heart disease anyway. And I've been involved in research exposing that. Even drug trials that lower cholesterol do not show a clear correlation with reducing heart attacks. So what's happened is you've had flawed science mm -hmm. and then you've had a huge industry that's developed around that. Both food industry mm -hmm. have made money from that flawed science, you know, pushing low fat foods, sugar industry benefiting. We've got a drug industry, mm -hmm. trillion dollar industry of statins, mm -hmm. which are cholesterol lowering drugs, right? And then that is a barrier to change as well. Because even when new science emerges, it takes a long time before it's accepted because there are very powerful industries that are making money from essentially what is now fraud. Mm -hmm. I want to say fraud is deliberate deception in order to make money, and that's the big problem we have in healthcare now. Mm -hmm. But it's actually the food industry that makes us ill, and then the um, pharmaceutical industry is going to cure us. Yeah, no, that's ultimately <laughs> what happens in a way. Uh -huh. Yeah. because you've written a book, The P.O.P. Diet, uh, which is a low-carb uh, Mediterranean diet. Um, for people who are not familiar with that, could you explain um, yeah, how people should eat according to that diet? Yeah, so my first book was co-written, uh, co co-authored with um, a former international athlete called Donal O'Neill. And it came off the back of the first documentary that we also made called The Big Fat Fix. And it was based upon looking at the secrets of longevity and the, where did the Mediterranean diet originate from. And it's from this tiny Italian village in southern Italy. Donal had actually 
uh, looked this up and it was pretty interesting how he found this out because it wasn't well publicized, but the actual Mediterranean diet started in Piopi. And Ansel Keys, who was the actual American scientist who promoted the whole low-fat food movement, he spent a lot of his time doing research out of Piopi. So we went to Piopi in 2015 um, to look at the village, speak to people, try and understand how they lived, even the elderly people there, and try to see how, why did these people have such good longevity? You know, they were living into their 90s and they were very well and healthy for that, you know, even for elderly people. And, um, and in that we discovered, of course, you know, people think of diet as just a food, but diet actually is derived from the Greek word diata, mm -hmm. which means uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So it's about a lifestyle. Diet is definitely a big component and important, but it's also about being out, outside, vitamin D, moving, you know, d not being sedentary. It was about stress. You know, it was a, a good environment to be in, in this fishing village, sense of community. Mm -hmm. So all these things combined are actually the secrets to a good health. And certainly when it comes to heart disease, Ellen, 80% of heart disease is environment and lifestyle. Maybe 15 to 20, maybe 20% 20 max is genetics. Most of it is to do with lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So um, we basically wrote this book called The Piopi Diet where we put it all together to help people understand the evolution of the thinking of nutrition science, but also the impact of lifestyle changes and how quickly one can um, improve your risk factors for heart disease and quality of life just within a few weeks of drastic changes to diet. Mm -hmm. But without counting calories, without following a low fat diet, yeah. And my own analysis of the science, which I published in medical journals as well, was that for me, the, certainly when it comes to heart disease prevention and even stabilization management or even reversal of heart disease from a dietary perspective, there are two areas that are, should be addressed. One is insulin resistance. Okay, I'll come on to that in a second. And then the other one is chronic inflammation. So insulin resistance is essentially the body becoming resistant to the hormone insulin over time. And uh, what that does is it is itself a big risk factor or driver, the biggest, most important driver for heart disease development. Mm -hmm. Okay, because chronically raised insulin actually damages the inner lining of the heart arteries, endothelial, we call it endothelial dysfunction. And um, probably over 80% of people who develop heart disease will have a degree of insulin resistance. They may not even know it. So insulin resistance from a dietary perspective is driven by high refined carbohydrate foods, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. So sugars and starch. So if you keep those down, your insulin levels are light, unlikely to be particularly high. And, um, and then of course, the other things that drive insulin resistance is being sedentary, so not keeping active, mm -hmm. not getting enough sleep, having too much stress. In, um, in parallel to that, and even overlapping a little bit, is chronic inflammation, which is actually what heart disease is. It's a chronic inflammatory disease. Mm -hmm. It isn't caused by high cholesterol. You know, this is all nonsense. It's a chronic inflammatory disease and anything, any toxin in the body will cause the body to produce these inflammatory markers or in inflammation. And that over time will cause damage to the arteries and all the cells actually in the body will be damaged. Even cancer is probably has mm -hmm. a big role to play with chronic inflammation as well. And therefore, the dietary components that are anti-inflammatory are things like extra virgin olive oil, oily fish, omega-3 fatty acids, nuts and seeds. So it was really, and even, you know, uh, polyphenols from um, these compounds that you find in, in whole fruit and vegetables. So it was, what does the nutrition science tell us about the types of foods that have the best evidence for having those properties, combined with some clinical trials and what we call observational data? And I basically suggested that this is really, so it should be a Mediterranean diet. Now, a lot of people might think it's a lot of bread and pasta and all that kind of thing. But actually, you know, it depends where you're starting from. But essentially, those foods, the starches should be kept to a minimum. And the key components in terms of health and improving your health are going to be those things I talked about already. Mm -hmm. So that's why I would promote or my first choice, you know, everyone's different, but my first recommendation to my patients for weight loss, whether it's type 2 diabetes, whether it's high blood pressure, they're also linked to insulin resistance, is to follow a low-carb Mediterranean diet. Yeah. Well, that's actually opposite because, I don't know, in the UK, but here in Belgium, we've got this food triangle. And, and in school, that is taught, and it uh, involves a lot of carbs. Eat bread, eat pasta, whereas people, yeah, we all need to eat differently. Yeah, so the thing about this, these sorts of carbohydrates, they don't have much nutrition. It's pure glucose. 
Mm -hmm. And unless you're going to utilize that energy quickly, any of the excess glucose you consume will get converted to fat. Mm -hmm. With fat and protein, they have, other, they have other functions in the body. They're involved, con but with starch, it's pure energy, that's it, mm -hmm. with very little nutrition. Mm -hmm. So if people understand that, they'll realize actually mm -hmm. that this is not a good way to have, it should not be the base of your diet. Mm -hmm. you know? Some athletes get away with it you know, for when they're doing six hours of exercise a day. They can be on these very high carbohydrate diets and it will not help, you know, not contribute to weight gain. But we don't have to fully eliminate it out of our diet, I suppose. It depends where you're starting from. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody that's metabolically healthy mm -hmm. and you're otherwise normal weight, then you can probably get away with it more, right? But over time, you become more insulin resistant with age anyway. So things change. So I've seen football players and soccer players and great athletes, and you, you know, I don't have to name them, don't want to put, point a finger, you know, embarrass them, but they just balloon out, you know, in their middle age, they stop doing the exercise, they've got huge pot bellies and they're eating the same thing. Yeah. Somebody I know who I met recently as well, and he's losing weight, I'm just looking at some of my work, and he was a famous football player. And uh, he was telling me, God, I've, 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 I can't believe, you know, he's getting through a bottle of Coca-Cola a day, a whole bottle. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was a brilliant football player, but he was able to get away with it initially, but now he's got this pot belly. And he's, you know, he's realized that's what's, what it is. Yeah. So keeping the same diet, you know, you can't sustain that level of activity for, you know, if you look at even a lot of these elite athletes, um, you know, they, they pass their peak um, when they hit 30. A lot of them go into retirement in their mid 30s, mm -hmm. right? And that's not that old. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the time they're able to get away mm -hmm. with this stuff. But mm -hmm. you can't you can't sustain that through your middle age. It's going to cause you health problems. But what really concerns me is that our children are exposed to so much um, processed food so much uh, uh, hidden sugars in the processed food and they're influenced uh, by these celebrities and, and, and famous uh, sports figures um, who influence them. And as a mom, when I'm walking with my kids through the supermarket and I'm saying, oh, no, don't eat this, don't eat that, because I'm well aware of what we should eat. But it's very hard to tell your children because they say, mom, it says it's healthy. It says no added sugars. It says no gluten. And people tend to think, wow, it's healthy. So we're so misled by this gigantic industry. And what, I, what really concerns me is that because the kids are not educated in school. So, um, yeah. What would you tell um, a class of, 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 let's say, eight years old? How, how should they eat? Listen, very simple rule of thumb. So if it's marketed as healthy, mm -hmm. it's usually the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. It's complete opposite. Mm -hmm. The ultra processed food that you've named is a really important point to discuss and something you can even educate eight year olds on. So first and foremost, ultra processed food, what is it? So in simple terms, it's anything that's packaged, industrially produced, but a packaged food that kids at eight years old can figure this out. If you look at the packet, then you can count five or more ingredients, mm -hmm. usually with additives and preservatives. It's ultra processed and you should not touch it. Mm -hmm. We have a multitude of data now, all pointing in one direction, that consumption of these foods is associated with heart disease, type two diabetes, cancer, even in people irrespective of their weight, okay? They're usually nutrition deficient foods. They're a combination of starch, unhealthy oils, sugar, they're designed by the food industry to be hyper palatable, cheap to produce, high profit margins. And the way that they affect the body is increasing, they increase chronic inflammation. They're toxic in many ways. But the problem is this, Ellen, certainly in the UK and I suspect in Belgium, it may not be that different. 50% of all the calories consumed in the Western diet now, at least 50% is 60% in America, is ultra processed food. Mm. Extraordinary, isn't mm. it? And the reason that has happened, as I explained earlier, is the food industry have been able to push and market all these products. But likely also for many people, these become addictive. Mm -hmm. Just like tobacco, you know, goes hooked on cigarettes. 50% of the population, by the way, people forget this. In 1970, 50% of the Western world population, adults, were smokers. 50%. Mm -hmm. Right now it's down to less than 20%. And the impact of that has been huge in helping people's health. Now we're having to cope with a, a, some, a different type of entity that is a vector of disease, and that's the food industry. Mm -hmm. They basically harm people for profit, and they deceive people for profit. And therefore, and people don't know about it, and people are deceived, therefore, I call them, um, and we'll get onto it later, you can say the same with the pharmaceutical industry, people need to understand they are enemies of democracy. 
So if a kid learns that in school, that would be one of the best things they can learn for their health. Mm -hmm. If it comes out of a packet, you can read five or more ingredients, it's not good for you, don't eat it. Mm -hmm. But even the fruit and the vegetables nowadays is not as nutritious as when we had it back in the days when it was basically straight from farm to table, uh, pretty much. So I'm, I'm concerned about it. So should we supplement them extra or...? So, I, I mean, I haven't looked at any very detailed research. People talk about this, saying that the, the food has changed, and it probably has. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, Ellen, certainly with my patients, even myself, um, if you have a real food diet mm -hmm. and it's varied you know let's say you're getting fish and meat and vegetables and all that kind of stuff it's highly unlikely you're going to be nutritionally deficient mm -hmm. okay. so i'm not against supplements and i think they have a role in certain conditions if there's a deficiency or people who take for example vitamin d is a big problem uh, vitamin d deficiency in the western world and and it's safe so i would recommend generally most people should be taking vitamin d um, but and, and maybe vitamin C when it comes to recovery or you know people to help them get over respiratory virus virus type illnesses but in general I think there's an overkill of supplementation mm -hmm. and you got to remember they're also an industry and they want to yeah. make money and they want to convince you it's a great story to tell mm -hmm. you can't get the you know you can't get enough nutrition from your whole fruit and vegetables come and take a supplement mm -hmm. but talking about <laughs> vitamin D there was this um, this story all over the news a few weeks ago here in Belgium that a lady killed herself uh, by an overdose of vitamin D. But she was an elderly lady and, and, and she took an absurd high dose. And it was all over the news and I was like, but so many people all over the globe uh, get killed by prescribed drugs every day and it's never a news item and it's vitamin D. So, uh, and, and, and that is news and she was even you know, older than eight years old, and people, oops, they're afraid of taking vitamin D now. Yeah, I mean, some that, people might be afraid. Yeah, that's very, un it's the first time I've ever heard of it. It's very unusual, that yeah. kind of situation. You said she must have taken something ridiculously high in terms of doses. Yeah, exactly. But actually, the media would be doing a much greater service to the public if on a daily basis they would tell the public that the third most common cause of death after heart disease and cancer globally is prescribed medications, what your doctor prescribes for you. The third? Yep. Wow. That's, well, that's Peter Ghosh's estimate. He's a co-founder of the prestigious Cochrane Collaboration. And a lot of these are pills over medication, you know, um, older people, psychiatric drugs, blood pressure pills, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is a lot. Yeah. yeah. So that's what people need to know. Mm -hmm. And you feel that we could um, reduce um, the amount of medication by living a different lifestyle, drastically reduce our sugar intake, um, eating um, lots of um, unsaturated fats, mostly unsaturated fats, and uh, live a, a not so stressful life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, when you look at the Lancet Global Burden of Disease reports, Poor diet now is responsible for more disease and death mm -hmm. than physical inactivity, smoking, and alcohol combined. So diet is a big one. It's a big one, absolutely. I'm not too worried about saturated fat, though. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't any issue with saturated fat mm -hmm. at all. I mean, I was involved in busting the you know, declaration here. I, was bust, I busted that myth in its role in heart disease in 2013, and then I reinforced it with two other cardiologists in 2017. And all the research that's done since then, the reanalyses of information, doesn't show any association with saturated fat and development of heart disease mm -hmm. at all. I wouldn't say it should be the base of the diet because I think the Mediterranean components are important, but things like cheese and red meat, and once you get the base of your diet right, you can have those, I tell my patients, you know, have those to your heart's content, enjoy that. Mm -hmm. As eating a steak is not gonna give you a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Eating three steaks a week is not gonna give you a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Eating five steaks a week is not gonna give you a heart attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> good to know. But um, do you think, um, yeah, do you have other, um, because you, you've exposed quite a lot of fraud eh, uh, of, of medical misinformation, can you, can you give me some other examples? Um, well, in terms of, uh, okay, so if you look at the, one of the most prescribed drugs in the history of medicine, mm -hmm. are statin drugs, mm -hmm. estimated to be prescribed to one billion people worldwide. Right, and this has been sold to us as the most important medication in preventing and even managing heart disease. So a lot of my work was looking at the 
I've used statins myself. I'm not saying they don't have a role, but it's about breaking down the information in a way that is understandable to patients so they know what the benefit is and what the potential harms could be and, and not to give them the illusion of protection because many people take their pills, they lower their cholesterol, they think they're not going to have a heart attack and then they have a heart attack and they wonder what happened. And that's because statins themselves, for most of the people who are prescribed them, who have not had heart disease, as a preventative tool, only give you, Ellen, probably about a 1% benefit. So if you take the statin every day for five years and you trust the clinical trials that come from the drug industry, which are kept commercially confidential, and then they pay the regulators who then approve them, right? Then it will give you a one in a hundred chance over a five year period of pre preventing you having a non-fatal heart attack or a non-disabling stroke with no increase in lifespan. So what we call no mortality benefit. Mm -hmm. Most patients don't know, they're not told that. If you tell patients that and say, what do you think would you like to pay, take the pill? 99% chance it won't help you. Most of them say no. The benefits are higher if you've had a heart attack already or you've had a stent or you've diagnosed with angina and that benefit becomes one in 39 in preventing a further heart attack and one in 83 in terms of preventing death or delaying death. So that's what I advocate for. And, and this is important because breaking the numbers down in that way is what we call part of ethical evidence-based medical practice but most doctors not deliberately in my opinion are not doing that and you could argue then therefore they are practicing unethical medicine mm -hmm. so patients get a very exaggerated idea about the benefits of the statin drug and then there's reluctance to stop the drug when when they get side effects mm -hmm. and side effects can be disabling quality of life limiting side effects like muscle symptoms muscle aches fatigue, that kind of thing, but it can cause lots of other problems, brain fog, stomach problems, erectile dysfunction. So um, that's the way I approach. But that's, a ben again, for a lot of people hearing this, they'll be shocked mm -hmm. that this is what the uh, absolute benefits of statins are if you don't get side effects. Mm -hmm. And side effects can affect maybe anything from 20 to 50% of people at some point during their life. Yeah. But I mean, if you go with an illness, um even a, a chronic illness, especially a chronic illness, to a doctor, a conventional doctor, they just give you um, a wide range of variety of pills that you can uh, choose from, and then that pill that you take uh, probably has side effects, and then you have to take uh, pills um, to cover up the side effects. So you're basically a, a lifelong customer for uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Yes. So it's kind of convenient uh, nowadays with all these uh, uh, chronic illnesses, but not many doctors um, look at the lifestyle um, of the patient and it tells a lot, right? Yeah, I mean, I do it all the time and with all of my experience as a practicing cardiologist who trained in interventional cardiology who did heart stents, um, you know, good health does not come out of a medicine bottle. Now, that, that doesn't mean there isn't a role for medicine, but we are doing way too much in terms of prescribing pills, especially for chronic disease. Most of what we do in medicine, which is great, is managing acute illness. Right, emergencies, people having heart attacks, emergency operations, open, you know, bypass heart surgery, broken bones, orthopedic stuff. That's what we're really, really good at. We are not good at managing chronic disease. We haven't been. And we weren't, partly because this has crept up on us over the last two or three decades. But the approach has been, as seen as an opportunity by the drug industry, is to get people more pills. So let's get you on blood pressure pills, let's get you on diabetes pills, let's get you on cholesterol pills. And most of these conditions actually can be not just prevented, but even reversed. Mm -hmm. And I do that with my patients and I get them off their pills and they come off their blood pressure pills. They get their type 2 diabetes into remission with sometimes within four weeks mm -hmm. just by changing diet. And they're shocked and they, they don't want people don't want to be on pills most of their life because the one thing about the pills is first and foremost, the roles and benefits of them are very, very marginal anyway. And most people, patients aren't told that. Um, and but they they almost always cannot, what they can't do is improve your quality of life. Mm -hmm. sure. They can only potentially make your quality of life worse if you get side effects. Mm -hmm. With the lifestyle changes, you're doing two things. You're improving risk factors and you're improving quality of life. Mm -hmm. So it's a no brainer, mm -hmm. but the system doesn't encourage doctors, partly because also we're not trained mm -hmm. to understand things about nutrition and lifestyle. Um, and then the barriers, of course, a lot of the guidelines are, medical guidelines are being influenced by the drug industry because the regulators, for example, get most of their money from drug industry. And it didn't used to be like this. It's only happened 
in the last couple of decades, it's, it's increased. So they have so much power and control over the narrative, over information, over what your doctor tells you. Um, but their, their motives and incentives are not to look after your health or make you better. They're there to make money and they deceive to make money. And often they behave in ways that are described as psychopathic. So when one understands that, you can explain a lot of the issues and problems that we have in health today. And just look around, you know, certainly in the UK, our life expectancy has stalled since 2010. Okay, so we've stopped, life has stopped increasing. Mm -hmm. But more people within that are getting sicker, have chronic disease for longer. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we, and we are regressing, we are going backwards. Yeah, isn't that health. weird? We're getting thicker and thicker and, and, yeah. and, <laughs> and nobody's thinking why, how does that come? I well, mean, that's the questions we need to ask ourselves and that's yeah, what I exactly. ask, you know, is, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons I became a campaigner, Ellen, as well, is I qualified as a doctor in 2001. Mm -hmm. But what I saw over that time period up until 2010, 2011, yeah, I saw more and more patients coming in with chronic illnesses and I thought, hold on, there's something not right here. What's going on here? Why is there obesity epidemic as well? That was a big component of a diet related disease. So that's when I started doing the research. And when I did that, what I found shocked me. Mm -hmm. You know, there was very good data and information of things that you can do to come off pills or improve your risk factors to a significant degree. Um, but also I realized when I dug deep that a lot of the scientific information what was published in the medical literature was all being influenced by drug industry or food industry. So part of my campaigning was exposing that and getting people to understand that and then to... Because I think people are a little bit aware, they're aware that they have gigantic power, but, but they don't fully realize the impact, I think. Yes, I think so. Or if they do, they see it as such a big problem, it's such a syst systematic failure mm -hmm. um, within, you know, um, the establishment, if you like that they see it's too big a problem for them to solve and therefore it's easier to bury their heads in the sand or think it's someone else's problem or become apathetic. But with everything that you um, know, all your knowledge about um, the fraud of big food and big pharma and the medical disinformation, I was really surprised um, during COVID because I was already following your work and I was like, this doctor, um, he sees it and he dares to speak up and he dares to fight against uh, medical disinformation and, and the food industry and, and, and big pharma. And then I saw you um, promoting the vaccine um, on the news and I was like, I didn't expect that at all from you. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So I started actually being quite active in um, the COVID pandemic in 2020 because I was the first doctor, certainly in the UK and maybe in the world to get into the mainstream news because I've written about this stuff to highlight the link between obesity and immune system dysfunction. So I was very prominent actually on that. Um, and I was I, I went on Good Morning Britain initially to say that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson likely got sick if you remember, he got admitted to the hospital at one stage because of his weight and I wrote some articles and then it became, I was being asked by the Secretary for Health to advise on the link between obesity and COVID. And it covers a lot of the stuff we already mentioned before about how ultra processed foods should be the target of regulatory action. So that was all there and that carried on. I wrote a book called The 21 Day Immunity Plan that came back and all that. So I was very active during 2020. And then of course the vaccine came on the scene um, and it's a really good point. So despite us knowing the history of the drug industry and all the stuff they've done in the last few decades in terms of getting us to an over-medicated population by convincing doctors and members of the public to take pills they don't really need. Traditional vaccines, and I still believe this to be the case, Ellen, it's really important to make this clear, are probably the safest of all of the drugs that we pharmacological. Are you still sure of that? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm not sa no drug is completely safe. Let me just give you an example. So if you look at traditional vaccines, the published literature tells us the risk of a serious adverse event is one in a million. Okay, so nothing, that doesn't mean it's 100% safe, but it's still 99.99999, whatever, right? So we've got to look things in context. Let's have that conversation. Nothing is completely safe. No drug is completely safe. Mm -hmm. But when you look at all of those things, traditional vaccines are still the safest. 
And then um, when the vaccine came out, I was one of the first to have two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Part of the reason for that was uh, my father, who had an exaggerated fear from COVID, like many older people, and even many people now, um, was worried about me. And there was a little bit of that back and forth saying, I want you to have, you know, you must have it. And I said, okay, dad, I'll have it. But I also had it under the impression that I would protect my patients. You know, for us as doctors, I've had so many vaccines in my life, but protecting my patients was more important. So I had two doses. And you weren't, you didn't have any fears whatsoever? Not at all, no. No, in not fact, at all? No, not, not, not just did I not have any fears. I remember having um, arguments. Listen, I'm very open and empathetic to all different perspectives, right? So I was never that kind of guy that's going to name and shame or point people and saying you're stupid, why are you having a vaccine? But one of my best friends, I remember him talking to me, and he's a journalist, and he um, said he had all these concerns. And I was seeing this stuff on social media about microchips and the vaccine, fertility problems, depopulation agenda. And he called me up and he said, yeah, but you don't know the long-term effects. And I, and I just thought, I thought he was being ridiculous. And I said, what do you mean? Yeah, maybe you'll end up growing two heads. Maybe the, you'll have the vaccine and then suddenly you'll grow another head. Mm -hmm. I mean, I made a mockery of it. Mm -hmm. He wasn't able to give me any clear reason why. And I think most people even then weren't able to. It was a trust issue. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of, I don't feel quite right. I want to wait and see. That was very rational and, and, and reasonable to do. When I had the vaccine, Ellen, and when it was originally rolled out in the UK, the narrative and the decision making at that point, even from Secretary for Health, is this is only going to be for high risk people. Mm -hmm. This is only going to be for the elderly and vulnerable people. So in, in February 2021, I went on Good Morning Britain because it, we had already started getting data that people from ethnic minority backgrounds in the UK were more vaccine hesitant. And that is partly because, and that's the same in other countries around the world, some of the most marginalized people in society are people from black and ethnic minority communities. Those people are less likely to trust government yeah. because they're not looked after. They're, you know, they're, 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 they, uh, a lot of them just don't feel that the, their governments look after their interests. So therefore they don't trust government. Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand the reasoning for a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people were starting from that position. So I convinced a film director friend of mine, Grinda Chadda, who had done a movie like Bennett Like Beckham, and some people might be familiar with her work. She would texted me and asked me, she always comes to me with medical advice. And I said, Grinda, to be honest, I don't, I can't tell you for sure how effective the vaccine is going to be. We don't know because in general, actually, traditionally, vaccines for respiratory viruses are not very good in terms of efficacy. But I said, I don't, I couldn't conceive, Ellen, at all, at all, of the possibility of any harm, at all. Yeah, yeah. Not at all, because of my knowledge of traditional vaccines. Even if it was done quickly or whatever else, I mean, you can look back now and with hindsight, but how many people have expertise in vaccine development? I mean, you, you also have to rely on immunologists and vaccine specialists, not everybody is corrupted, right? So everybody was saying the same thing there. Um, and, that, that in fact, and the other thing as well, although it came from, you know, it was ultimately a joint venture with BioNTech and Pfizer, the people that actually were able to develop the vaccine were a Turkish couple. They weren't people that were employed by Pfizer. They were people that genuinely thought they were doing the right thing. They wanted to do something good for humanity. I still believe that to be the case at the beginning. So I, I took the vaccine. I went to Good Morning Britain. I said, I understand why people are concerned. And I, talk, and, they, and I think the TV people weren't expecting me to talk about the fraud of the drug industry. Mm -hmm. They thought I'd just come on and say, yeah, yeah. But I said, listen, we understand why people are like this. Think about what drug industry have done. So you consider them safe, but effective as well? Yeah, so the clinical trial data and all the news headlines around the world, and I hadn't spent time looking at it. To be honest, because I wasn't concerned, mm -hmm. I didn't scrutinize the evidence initially on the, on the Pfizer data but had basically taken in this 95% effectiveness. Now, 95% effectiveness with a vaccine means you vaccinate 100 people, 95 people are not going to get, if exposed, are not going to get the virus. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. That's what we were sold on. Mm -hmm. So I had bought into that uh, and then took the vaccine. And then, um, I mean, lots of things evolved quite quickly. Uh, one, slowly things for me started to think, hold on a minute, something's going a bit too far here. Though, and it started to encourage younger people to have it. I thought this isn't, they don't need it because I knew the risk from COVID. We knew it wasn't stopping transmission within a few months. And okay, then we know straight away. It then wasn't stopping infection either. Then the narrative changed. Well, it won't stop you getting infected, but it's going to stop you getting severe disease. So I thought this is something not quite right here. That was slowly kind of just getting into my psyche. Then um, my father suffered a sudden cardiac arrest in July 2021. He was a very fit, active guy. 
Um, this is two, six months after having the second dose. Um, I couldn't explain why he'd had a cardiac arrest. His post-mortem findings in particular were odd. He had very severe narrowings in two, two of the vessels. There are three major vessels of the coronary arteries. I knew his cardiac history. We'd had heart scans on him a few years earlier. If anything, there was something mild and it should not have got to the stage it did in that space of time, especially because he paid a lot of attention to his lifestyle. I couldn't explain it at all. And then about November 2021, it's interesting, I actually went in October to Sweden to give a, uh, some lectures about all the stuff I'd done on linking metabolic health and COVID. And a f uh, I got a phone call from a journalist with the Times newspaper. And she said, Dr. Malhotra, we've had this unexplained increase in heart attacks in Scotland, 25% increase, what do you think is going on? And I actually didn't talk about the vaccine. She asked me about it, but I said, listen, it's probably a combination of poor diet and stress during lockdowns because lockdowns themselves, I knew would have probably have a knock on effect in terms of heart attacks. And she asked me the vaccine. I said, listen, it would be naive of me to completely exclude it as a good scientist, mm -hmm. right? I think it's unlikely, but we can't exclude it completely. So that article then ran. And it was a few weeks after that, that data emerged from America, published in a credible journal called Circulation, an abstract, which actually revealed that within eight to 10 weeks of middle aged a group of middle-aged people, hundreds of them being looked after by one particular doctor, um, markers in the blood that were associated strongly and well validated with heart attack risk in the next five years had increased the risk after the mRNA vaccines from 11% to 25% in just eight weeks. And I thought, and I understood the mechanism because we talked earlier about chronic inflammation. Not many, not many cardiologists have that at the forefront of their mind, the understanding that heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition. But because I published on it, and I know that and I have expertise in that area, mm -hmm. suddenly I thought, ah, okay, it's causing an acute, a, a quite significant inflammatory response in the body that's persistent for a couple of months. That would also, suddenly I realized that's what happened to my dad. Mm -hmm. It's accelerating heart disease. So I then decided I was going to look at the evidence properly. I went on GB News, I talked about it. And, I, and then around that time, there was a couple of other bits of data. The heart attack increase was there. Um, a whistleblower from a prestigious institution in England called me, a cardiologist, to tell me that a group of researchers had accidentally discovered, with the use of very specialized heart imaging modalities, that the vaccinated people with mRNA vaccines were having inflammation of the arteries, and it wasn't there in the unvaccinated. And I thought, oh. So it was all coming together and I thought, okay, there's a problem. I then decided to, you know, around that time, I had been on the news quite a lot because I had exposed there was an ambulance delay in my dad's death that was being covered up across the whole country. Um, and uh, I used those opportunities to basically also mention, this. a Dr. Malhotra, what's going on with the NHS? I said, listen, we've not tackled big food and big pharma, big pharma over-medicated population, side effects, people being admitted. We've got food industry driving obesity and people being admitted. I said, we need to, those are the root causes. But I said, I also want to say at this point, because our Secretary State for Health had, had already said that we were going to mandate the vaccine for healthcare workers. And I thought, this is unbelievable. One, we've got now a signal of harm. Two, it doesn't stop transmission. Mm -hmm. It should not be mandated for anybody. So, and I never supported mandates anyway. We've never done that in, in, in UK. We've never supported, like even our medical bodies, royal colleges have never, we don't, because it doesn't work. And we believe that if it's about drugs or vaccines, that we should use persuasion, not coercion, persuasion, but no mandates. It's still ultimately the decision of the patient. And I thought this is wrong. So I then campaigned and helped overturn the, the mandates for healthcare workers. I was one of the most prominent people talking about it. And I took a lot of backlash behind the scenes. But in that time, I then decided to critically appraise the evidence, Ellen, properly and look at the vaccines and look at the actual benefits and harms and break it down. And I won't bore you with all the details, but the key bit of evidence that emerged from all of that was a reanalysis of Pfizer and Moderna's original trials that, that the regulators around the world approved and was then coerced and mandated. And what they found, independent researchers with credibility published in the journal Vaccine, from the very beginning, you are more likely to suffer a serious side effect, hospitalization, disability, life-changing event from the vaccine than you were to be hospitalized with COVID. <laughs> which so means, the cure is worse. Which means, yes, the cure is worse than the disease. But what it means is it should never have been likely, never been approved for a single human in the first place. And now we are picking up the pieces. And I then, in my own clinical experience, seeing patients were seeing vaccine injuries, I was spotting things. Um, and, you know, one of the things that then emerged, so that rate of harm um, 
Ellen is, was found to be about one in 800 from the trial mm -hmm. in the first two months. It's at least one in 800 because the people selected in these clinical trials tend to be healthier, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, they, they, the drug industry designed the trials with people who are less likely to get side effects. In the real world, they, they're going to be people more likely to get side effects. So one in 800 is a minimum. And it also, because the mechanism of harm increases acceleration of heart disease, many people are going to start dropping dead from cardiac arrest potentially six months, a year, a year and a half after having the vaccine. So you took uh, two doses of the vaccine. Um, some people took even more. Um, what would you tell them? How can they um, optimize their health? So the first thing to say in terms of serious adverse mm -hmm. effects, Ellen, most of them tend to occur within the first few weeks, the first few months. Mm -hmm. So people are well mm -hmm. after that time. In general, they shouldn't be worried. Mm -hmm. In terms of longer term risks, what we find is with the vaccine side effects issue, a lot of people who have suffered severe side effects are people who are the same people vulnerable to COVID. Overweight, obese, poor metabolic health. Mm -hmm. What I've been doing with vaccine injuries is I've been patients, a lot of these is I get them on a healthy lifestyle and they tend to feel better. A lot of their symptoms improve that are similar to long COVID, mm -hmm. fatigue and all that kind of stuff. So really that's what we should be focusing on anyway. Is your mental and physical health in the best place it can be? If it's not, why not? And then what can you do about it? And it's going to be predominantly a lifestyle approach. What are you eating? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you being reasonably active? Are you controlling your stress? Mm -hmm. Are you meditating every day yeah. for 20 to 30 minutes? I mean, these things are really powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's what people need to focus on. Yeah, I agree. You know, we're taught in medical school that 80% of your diagnosis comes from the history, from the conversation with the patient. If you know your stuff and you ask the right questions, you'll get the right answers and you can make a diagnosis in 80% of cases without even examining the patient, mm -hmm. okay? The examination tests are there to confirm, but you have an idea already of the likely, what the likelihood is. And with the vaccine injuries, certainly when you ask the patients, a lot of them know, but one of the things that was missing from this whole understanding of the vaccine injuries is that the World Health Organization had endorsed a list that no one knew about of potential serious harms that could happen because of the vaccine and anything and everything that can go wrong with the heart is in there but lots of different organ systems but with the heart it's heart attacks arrhythmias heart failure cardiac arrest myocarditis pericarditis and the mechanism of harm is that the vaccine the spike protein which goes in the arm and thoughts to have a very mild response, causes a toxic effect to every organ tissue system in the every organ in the body, and can do that for up to four months or longer. Either direct toxic effect to those tissues, heart, brain, kidneys, liver, ovaries, testes, or causes an autoimmune reaction. And that's now what we're dealing with in the, in, in the you know in the real world, and it's horrific. My own obsession with being the best possible doctor I can be being a good historian, understanding all the possibilities of what could be going wrong, but listening to the patient. The other art of being a good doctor is empathy, mm -hmm. right? That's what's really important for, um, for a good patient outcome and also for patients feeling reassured and empowered, right? So for me, that I use those tools and I was able to see vaccine injuries and likelihood of vaccine injuries in people that other doctors are ignoring or dismissing. Mm -hmm. But now in the whole COVID situation, I mean, doctors even, they didn't listen because there was this psychological manipulation uh, from the government that everybody needed to take it. Yes. So what's happened now is that the, um, we're having to deal with the aftermath of the fact that the indoctrination was so deep mm -hmm. that people are now becoming willfully blind to facts, right? So anything that questions a narrative that's is safe and effective, automatically you're a bad person, you're an anti-vaxxer, you know, you're stupid. It's, not, it's stopping people even being open-minded to listening to the truth. Yeah. We're gonna call this willful blindness. So this is when human beings turn a blind eye to the truth in order to feel safe, avoid conflict, reduce anxiety and protect prestige and fragile egos. Mm -hmm. So the barrier we've got now, Ellen, isn't the evidence. The evidence is overwhelming. One, this vaccine should likely not have been given to a single human in the first place, right? And the facts are so clear that the harms outweigh the benefits with all the data we have that the facts alone are not enough. The, the barrier is a psychological barrier, mm -hmm. willful blindness and also rooted in the fact that a lot of people were so scared of COVID that it, it inhibited one's ability to engage in critical thinking. Mm -hmm.
but that's something for me that I've always been, I've always done, you know, even if I had not had an expertise or looked into the vaccine issue. And to be fair, we didn't have that information. People say, oh, you know, I knew and all. No, you didn't know. I was worried. I wanted to wait. But nobody in January or February could give me clear, this is a benefit of the vaccine and this is a harm. We didn't have that information at all. Mm -hmm. It's come out. And as soon as it came out and I was aware of it, I was able to then put it in a way that I could articulate it in the principles of evidence-based medicine. But then the question then is, you know, how do we get it wrong? Why did we get it wrong? And what do we do moving forward? And the problem is our regulators, who we trusted, most people trust, mm -hmm. the medical regulators, they failed to do their job properly. Partly because they get most of their money from the drug industry. Mm -hmm. Yet most doctors and public don't know that. Mm -hmm. So these failures in the system, are, most people are unaware of them. But, but when they make them aware of them, then they start opening up and thinking, ah, I understand now. Mm -hmm. This is not an anomaly. This was not a deliberate conspiracy. Mm -hmm. These were failures, structural failures in the system where over the last few decades, Ellen, these big powerful corporations who are there just to make money have more and more power and more and more control of our lives. And as I said earlier, they often behave like psychopaths in the way that they make money. And if you think about that, we ultimately have psychopathic entities that have more influence over the way we think, what we buy when it comes to food, what drugs we take. And it doesn't take a rocket, science, um, rocket scientist, Ellen, to figure out that is not very good for us mentally or physically. And that, in my view, is a big root cause behind many of the problems in healthcare today. Yeah, and then the power of the mainstream media, because they... Um you think they're funded during uh, COVID by uh, the drug industry? Well, in America, we know it's a big problem. A lot of these, like Pfizer, for example, sponsors a lot of these mainstream news channels and they even talk about it before it's sponsored by Bruce. This news item was brought to you by Pfizer. I mean, it's ridiculous when you think about it over here. I think a little bit more subtle here, it's about their capture of government and, you know, um, academics and everything else. It's a combination of factors, not directly so much of media and so in, in European countries. But it's more about the but collusion. But it seems that they copy paste. <laughs> they do. But I think one of the other issues is a lot of the media in this issue with COVID, essentially the way that this was treated, this battle against COVID was treated like almost we're at war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were on war footing. And if you're on war footing, editors of newspapers do not want to do anything that counteracts a narrative because they're afraid of the government. The government will do something or mm -hmm. pull their funding or do something to them. So that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know about uh, the UK, but here there was just one dominant narrative and there were no debates at all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And people are then, they're, they're not just getting one version of the truth. The, they're getting something that is a blatant lie, which is being, um, you know, camouflaged as the truth. Mm -hmm. But you managed to get on the mainstream uh, in the UK, eh? on BBC. Well, I've done so much work, you know, as an activist with them before. So I'm on their books and I'm considered someone who's a, a good spokesperson on, on medical issues. So, um, yes, in January the 14th, I think it was, if I remember correctly, they'd asked me to go and talk about statin drugs and cholesterol lowering drugs. And um, I just used the opportunity to say, listen, the big problem we've got now, the elephant in the room is the reason we're talking about this is because there's an issue of excess cardiovascular deaths, but almost certainly a big contributory factor based upon the data is the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. So yes, I did, I, uh, and then I was attacked and that's part and parcel, I'm used to that. You know, when you're an advocate and you're making progress, it's one of the things you understand and need to realize when you put your head above the par as, parapet. As soon as your work threatens an industry or an ideo uh, ideology, you will be attacked, mm -hmm. sometimes unrelentingly and viciously. So I had, you know, the smear stuff on there and, you know. And how do you cope with the backlash? Well, I, I, see it as a, I see it as a sign of progress, mm -hmm. right? Because one of the, you know, I have, I have many people that inspired me from people like Gandhi, Mandela, Martin Luther King, activists that, you know, put, put their head above the parapet and changed the world. And Gandhi, one of his lines, what Gandhi said was, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Mm -hmm. So once a fight's st starting in the mainstream where I'm getting attacked, for me, I was, this is brilliant. I just took us. Other people were very upset calling me up in tears. I can't believe they're saying this about you and this and this. I said, no, this is a sign of progress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> did you suffer from side effects? Yeah, I did. Um, I actually, although I didn't realize at the time, because now I know the mechanism of action that one of the side effects of the vaccine, it can cause inflammation in the brain or it can 
um, is I went into clinical depression within a few weeks, actually, of having wow. the vaccine. Yeah, into clinical depression. Um, took me a few months to come out of it. I was very depleted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're sure it's from the vaccine, but no symptom. Well, you, listen, in medicine, you can't be sure about anything because mm -hmm. it's not an exact science. You know? But people tend to think it's an they exact They do. Science. I mean, the thing is, you know, we're 50, it's, not, it's an applied science. It's not like physics or chemistry, mm -hmm. you know. It's a social science, a science of human beings. It's mm -hmm. constantly evolving more than other sciences do. So, um, you know, we're taught 50% of what you learn in medical school will turn out to be either outdated or dead wrong within five years of your graduation. The trouble is nobody can tell you which half, so you have to learn to learn on your own. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's a likely, you know, it's the most likely cause. Once you know, and there's no other trigger, you know that this is probably um, the likely cause. So that's, yeah, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. That's what I think happened. Yeah. And, and what's interesting about the side effects on the brain mm -hmm. uh, from the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer's own trial, in fact, in the World Health Organization list of potential side effects and in the trial, one of them, one of the serious side effects is psychosis. We also have to have compassion for people who are not as awake, mm -hmm. who are so indoctrinated with the vaccine, because I think many of them may be suffering from what we call delusion of benefit. Mm -hmm. Delusion means a fixed, firm, false belief mm -hmm. that is held despite evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. So many people who are willfully blind around the vaccine, don't want to talk about it, are living in a delusion. Mm -hmm that this vaccine is safe and effective. Yeah. It's not safe, it's definitely not effective. Mm -hmm. But even if you give them all the evidence, <laughs> even then they still believe it. So how can we um, encourage those people to think differently? Bec we have to be better at making sure the way we communicate with them comes from a place of compassion and empathy mm -hmm. and not from a place of ego or I told you so. Mm -hmm. And that means helping them understand that there is a psychological barrier here and understand that they, why they are fearful and s walk them through it slowly. I mean, my paper and my lectures do that. Mm -hmm. I just talk them through it so slowly. I think what helps me in particular, maybe makes me more credible is because I had the vaccine mm -hmm. and I also went and supported its use in high risk people. So they know that I'm not, I'm part, you know, I'm, I'm similar to them in many ways, but I explain the story of well, how I changed and I bring in the information and that's had big impact, mm -hmm. you know, around the world when I, wherever I've been speaking, it's turned people. Mm -hmm. It's not just an echo chamber. There are people who were not fully on board at all on one side of the argument who have, it's trying to convince them to get to the place where they can at least listen to you. Yeah. And yeah. that has to be done very carefully. Mm -hmm. But oh. at the end of the day, the facts are the facts. So we repeat the facts and you keep repeating the facts and you just keep hammering it and it gets through eventually. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel a bit powerless, like um, because so many people are reluctant, you know, um, it's so difficult to change them. And, um, and um, so what would you tell the people, you know, um, what should they do? What's your message? Um, Listen, it, it's so important. I think people should not underestimate the power of their own speech and the mm -hmm. power of the truth. Now, we've created society, the conditions in society are such that it is not safe to speak, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but what people need to understand is it's even less safe not to speak the truth mm -hmm. because the problem isn't going to go away and it's only going to get bigger and become even more difficult to overcome. Mm -hmm. So we have but to encourage we... people just to, even, even conversations with their friends, their families, they have to stand up and just think about, yeah. you know, you can't be apathetic. No. And, and if it's not working, try it different. Don't do the same thing. Try a different approach. Yeah. But if you know you are right, you know the truth, and these facts are important, and you are there to... We're all here to help each other and support each other. Certainly as a doctor, my job primarily is to improve my patients' outcomes, health outcomes, mental and physical health outcomes. Then we just have to keep trying. Mm -hmm. We can't become apathetic. No. Because but otherwise here in Belgium, not a lot of doctors speak out. I don't know how it is in the UK. I pro you probably know a lot of doctors who know, but don't, don't dare to speak out. And a lot of influential people either. Yeah. 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 There's a cultural problem here though, mm -hmm. Ellen. To get to this point where doctors are afraid, you know, um, if a doctor can't speak the truth or is afraid to speak the truth when it comes to their patients, what has medicine become? Yeah. The title of doctor disappears. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I speak I can't sleep at night knowing what I know, but I also say, well, I don't deserve the title of being a doctor. Mm -hmm. So they need to know that. They need to be told that. Yeah. They need to think about that. Mm -hmm.
it's about virtues, yeah? It's yeah, but this is a cultural phenomenon. I think this is part of this psychopathic determinants of health, this new term I came up with, mm -hmm. is um, the downstream effects of these psychopaths controlling our lives is it, it also takes us away from being virtuous. We are yeah. going more towards this materialistic type of society, away from spirituality and being virtuous. Yeah. It's the opposite of a psychopath. Mm -hmm. So that's we're going the wrong way. We need, to, we, need to, we need to go back to that because yeah. that's what it means to be human. That's, what it, that's how we're going to live the good and happy life and the healthy life is yeah. actually through that yeah. mechanism, speaking the truth, you know, understanding what's true um, and living our lives as virtuously as we can. Absolutely. Yeah. But the food industry numbs us and our children too. You know, they're numbed by all the sugar, but they're they, addicted they and they're it. addicted yeah. uh, on, on, on t TV screens, all the entertainment. So they, um, we, you know, if they start feeling better, they'll uh, live a more virtuously life, you yes, know? Yes, absolutely. But the thing is, most people don't know the, about these system failures that are inhibiting their ability to access the truth. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a, the general population and doctors don't know what's happening, mm -hmm. most of them. And they don't even know that they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But they do see um, some graphics, right? Because yesterday I saw a graphic um, and um, in the age group of uh, 15 uh, till 44 years old, um, the death rate was six times higher. Six times. I mean, the amount of uh, oncological consults uh, increased with 52%, if I remember correctly, yes. And then heart failures, 11% from 2019. That is, you know, don't they ask questions? Don't, it's, I find it so weird. Yeah, so they're ignoring it or they're being told that mm -hmm. this is because of COVID. This is a, the, so, you know, a lot of this information is being driven, this misinformation mm -hmm. is straight out of the big tobacco playbook. Mm -hmm. So when there were concerns of doctors that cigarettes were causing cancer or were causing heart attacks by the way doctors let's not forget this doctors used to promote cigarettes mm -hmm. they used to sit in their consultation rooms there were adverts what do, what cigarette do you take and the doctor would be smoking a cigarette mm -hmm. think about that yeah, how yeah. crazy is that yeah. so when all this was happening around realization smoking caused heart attacks there were academics that were paid to write articles in medical journals to say this is because of stress mm -hmm. it's got nothing to do with cigarettes so the same distraction is happening now not saying COVID isn't bad or COVID wasn't devastating for people, especially severe COVID and people hospitalized. No doubt about it, it was. Right now it's evolved into nothing worse than a cold. They're trying to blame all these excess deaths now happening on COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I think when people watch this uh, and they're like, yes, what he says, I, uh, it totally resonates with me. I believe him. But, you know, these industries are so gigantic. They've got so much power. What can we do? How can... I contribute to um, his mission, what, what would you say, what can we do? Well, listen, I think first and foremost, just make sure you keep speaking to people, mm -hmm. right? Friends, family, convince people, share information, mm -hmm. use social media, share yeah. videos, articles, right? Keep doing that stuff. Um, that's what I would suggest, Ellen, is the best thing that people can do. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm doing now is um, I'm about to co-produce my second film, uh, it's called First Do No Farm, P-H-A-R-M. <laughs> I love that and, title. Uh, yeah, and uh, we've got some really important big names that have already you know, agreed to be interviewed, including uh, Professor Rita Redberg, who's the editor of one of the major medical journals in America. She's a cardiologist, Jarmatil Medicine. Uh, John Abramson, doctor from Harvard, been done a lot of work in litigation involving drug industry. Um, and uh, Jay Bhattacharya, you may know. Uh, Robert Kennedy. We're going to get some really big names, but really I'm going to take people through a journey for, to help them understand how we got where we are today mm -hmm. and what we can do about it. Also with the components of the lifestyle uh, side of things. And I think, uh, I, I think it's going to be potentially one of the most important documentary films of our time. And the first one I co-produced, Big Fat Fix, had a massive impact on health policy in terms of sugar awareness in the UK. It was it premiered in Parliament, featured in New York Times, BBC World News. So we want to do something even bigger and stronger. But we're crowdfunding for that. So, you know, uh, you know, we need to raise about half a million dollars. Uh, we want to get that filmed in the summer and get it out next year. So people can contribute to that or at least share it or whatever else when it comes out. So I think that would be the, the thing to do. But also, yeah, just follow my Twitter. Um, I'm Dr. Asim Alhotra, um, lifestyle medicine doctor on Instagram. And, you know, share that information. I put st I'm an activist and campaigner. I want to keep pushing this message. And I think that's what people can do. Just learn a little bit more about it and then spread it. Spread the message, spread the word. 
and realize that we're all doing this together. We're fighting for humanity here. We're fighting for our children. And I think we're at a tipping point. This is where the bubble, this corporate tyrannical bubble is about to burst. And because of the vaccine, because the vaccine has affected almost everybody in the world, either directly or indirectly, if you took it, you, you know, you know, you've been duped once you realize what's happened. If you didn't take it, you may have been gaslighted or you wouldn't be able to travel. So everybody in the world yeah. pretty much has been affected by COVID and the vaccine issue. It's our opportunity really to expose and highlight how bad the system is mm -hmm. and how we got here and then change it. Do you truly think we can free ourselves Absolutely. from the corporate Abs theory? Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. But we've got to fight for it. Yeah. You know? And then just one more question. What then when we free ourselves? How are we going to build up the new system? Well, I think the new system should be based upon going back to the you know, virtues of honesty and integrity and transparency and openness and freedom of expression, you know, individual choice. All of those things that we value you know, in life that helps us to be the best possible humans we can be and helps us to optimize our mental and physical health. We've got all of those solutions there. Mm -hmm. All right. You've got my utmost respect and I truly admire your courage and I wish you all the best um, in your life mission. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.